Joey girls. Well, if you're wondering how tonight's going to go, tonight's going to be absolutely amazing. You can't go through COVID without God pouring out His Spirit on all flesh and doing something amazing in our midst, you know. You can't have a crucifixion without having a resurrection. So I just want to announce this. It's resurrection, this conference. This is the beginning of the best days of your life. This is God reversing the curse. This is God's blessing coming upon you. I'm gonna preach. I was meant to come two years ago, but I praise God I didn't come two years ago because I'm much, much better now. I'm more pizzazzy, more sparkly, more powerful than ever before. And uh, so I thank God for today. We're gonna give God one huge clap offering on your marks. Get set, go, come on. Okay, take your seats. So you can see that I've got some presents here and uh, I was gonna bring gold and frankincense, but I decided to go to TK Maxx. And who loves TK Maxx? Uh Uh-huh. Anyone wearing TK Maxx tonight? Just, it's a great store, isn't it? We thank God for TK Maxx. And uh, anyone had a wardrobe malfunction before they came out here tonight? Uh, Only women have wardrobe malfunctions. Men are quite happy in whatever they're wearing. You know, men have uh, anti-anorexia. When they look at themselves in the mirror, they always appear a lot thinner than they actually are. And uh, it's a disorder, but we'll let men uh, get away with that. So I've got some presents from uh, TK Maxx and that I wanna give to some very special people here. And the first uh, present I've got is for Pastor Lee. And I just wanna say, Lee, I just wanna say that, that In actual fact, what I did get you in here, just to give away the surprise, is a pair of sunglasses. And you know, it's very hard. I went back through your Instagram posts to have a look at the style. (laughs) You know, I'm quite metro. And uh, and I think I found your style, but you know, this is gonna sound a bit corny, but the amount of legacy that you've left, the amount of legacy that's not just in this room, that's been through the generations and been through the history of the ministry. Is that incredible? I think you'll be blown out when you get to heaven. I think, be, I think you'll have to wear these sunglasses because, because it'll be so bright, just the amount, the amount of legacy this church and your ministry has left upon this earth is absolutely outstanding. And... Um, and also, I just need to say this about Jacob, that when he wrestled with God, he was in the Valley of Jacob, uh, Jabok, which means struggle. And then uh, God changed his name to Israel, which means someone who struggles with God and wins. And I want to say that you've both got it. You've built a place that, that people can feel uh, unrushed in their struggle, but you've also got a place of incredible conquest, incredible victory. And, and I just believe that this place is, is the Israel of God, the place where we struggle with God and then we overcome. So thank you. Here's your present. Here's your sunnies. And uh, let's hope that they work. Love you so much. Hey, uh, I, got, I also got a present for, um, for Caroline, Carolina Gunza. Oh my. Oh, Carolina, can you believe it? Just everything that Carolina's been through, you'd have to have been through it to understand what it's like to go through it. And I was flicking through Instagram the other day and and up came a a comment uh, and it said that you can live life as if everything's unfair. Uh, You can blame your boss, you can blame where you work, you can blame your country and that. And uh, or you you can rise up as a leader and you can own it. And the first person to respond back to it was Carolina. Was a huge, I'm in for that, you know. And I just, you know, life's desperately unfair. But you know, you can live like a victim or you can live like a victor. And um, you know, the Bible says this and it's, 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 it's a reference. The Bible says, unless a grain of wheat dies, it abides alone. But if it does die, then it produces seed in all of its abundance. And I wanna say the future of your life is greater than the past within your life. The future, even going solo for a while, the future of solo is bigger than anything that you've experienced in the past because this is the way God works, that there's resurrection all over you. And we thank God for you. And you're setting the pace and you're showing people what it is to to continue in the calling of God for your life. on behalf of every woman within this place, we want to say thank you so much. And here's a little present for you. Love you. 
and uh, this last present. I don't know if she's here. I think she's here as for uh, Viv Mulheron. Is she, is she here? Where, where is she? Is she at the bank? Come, come down the front, come down the front, come and grab it off me. Give this warrior a huge round of applause. Oh my giddy aunt, they say in the United Kingdom. Come a little bit closer. A little bit closer. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Well, what a legend this woman is, right? She's been, she's faced 10,000 demons and she survived. She's faced hell and she survived. What an absolute outstanding example you are of the Kingdom of God in the 21st century, standing strong. You know, it's unbelievable what you've been through, but it's unbelievable. The reason why you've been through it is so you can help the thousands that are going to go through it, you know? You never have resurrection or revival without personal persecution and some people have to have gone through it early in early doors, early days in order to minister to the thousands who will eventually go through it and you're one of the ones that God chose not by accident because He knows the call of God upon your life is to be generous, is to be a giver, is to be a lifter of a generation. And I wish that we didn't have to go through cruel times, but it's cruel to be kind because God creates ministry out of it. And I wanna welcome you into an outstanding ministry of raising up thousands of people into resurrection life. If we honour you in Jesus' Name. There you go. Love you. Okay, so the big question that is on the media nowadays is what is a woman? (laughs) Like it seems to me that nobody knows what a woman is, right? Everyone knew a couple of years ago what a woman was, but somehow even, you know, biologists don't know. Um, Prime ministers don't know. Uh, university lecturers don't know. Nobody knows. It's just suddenly disappeared uh, what a woman is. And, uh, and you know, it's, 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 a, it's in one respect, it's a difficult question, right? Because people think there's just biology. But I know a lot of women with balls. <laughs> you know, like Kylie Minogue. Kylie Minogue's got balls. You know, she's been through cancer. She's a cancer survivor. She's an amazing woman. She's got, she's got low to average talent, but she's built, a, no, it's true though, but she's built a whole career out of it. Most people with her talent would never have picked a career in singing, but she picked a career and she survived. She's a national treasure, both in this country and in the United Kingdom. And not, not even to mention Danny Minogue, if Kylie's got balls, Danny's got bigger balls. She, she's got lower talent, but she's made a career. Margaret Thatcher's got balls. Well, she had them. And she did some amazing things. So, so it's not just biology. I know a lot of men with, a lot of men with boobs. You know, we call them man boobs or moobs. Moves is, is the, and let me say this about, about men with, with moves. It's okay, to, it's, it's probably the birthright of every man to have a pair just between 40 years of age and 50 years of age. If you keep on having them after 50, you might die from them, okay? Because it's a sign of a lack of fitness and a lack of personal care and a lack of personal hygiene as well. But, but you just can't tell nowadays. It's just simply through biology, you know? Even Shania Twain, she said one night, she really felt like a woman, but she'd been a woman since she was born. So what is, what is, is it male and female or is it, is it feminine and masculine? Well, what is masculine? Let me tell you in what I think masculine is. Masculine is power under restraint. I think masculine is, is an explosion that has a limitation to it. You being, being masculine is almost dying, but not dying. It's, 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 it's meekness, it's power that's constrained. 
And if ever you've been in any men's, you know, if you listen to men talking, you know, with a beer in their hand, it's, it's all about how near misses, about how they almost died. And, you know, because, because that's what men are about, taking it to the extreme, but not beyond the extreme. There's something very masculine about that. And, you know, we've kind of pitched it that, that, that men are macho. And yet, you know, it's not just about the V8 supercars. It's not just about how big your muscles are. Even ballet, even ballet itself can be a form of masculinity because you're bringing strength under control. The arts, the sciences, that I think that's, there's more than an essence in there rather than just physiology. I think there's something about masculinity that we need to get a hold of again. But I think in terms of what womanhood's about, what the feminine is, firstly I wanna say, and this is from my experience, that the feminine is being a mystery. <laughs> it's being mysterious. It's like being the ocean where a part of you touches a distant shore that nobody quite knows, especially men. But let me say this about a mystery. I'll say to every woman in this place, continue to be a mystery because men love to chase. And if you find yourself in exactly the same place this year as you were two years ago, then the chase goes, but you want a man to chase after you. So you want to continue to be a mystery. Anything could happen through you. You could become the CEO of a major company or you could simply breastfeed a young newborn baby. But both are in the confines of what womanhood is because it's unconfined. It's a mystery. It's mysterious. When my mum and dad uh, split up when uh, she was about 50 years of age, she went back to school and she got her HSC, high school certificate, whatever, right? And then she went to get a law degree and she realised that she wasn't quite up to speed and so she failed uh, the law degree three times in a row and they said you can't come back into the law faculty at a University in Canberra. And so she went and got an arts degree and then because she's got an arts degree they said you can go back and get your law degree. So then she got a law degree. So she's now 60 years of age with an arts degree and a law degree. And so then she joins a company uh, called Solicitors and she works there for five years and they said, we're, we're going to retire you out now. She said, I've only been working for five years. <laughs> and so she started her own company and she named it Gilpin and Associates with no associates. And so she worked the company for seven years, then she sold the company, and then she lived another 10 years after that. That's womanhood. That's the feminine. It's doing something that nobody else expects you to do. That's the future of who you actually are. But you know, the other thing I, I've thought in terms of the feminine is that it's a mystery, but, but also it's... it's it's, it's ever present. Look, women are, are present. When you talk to them, they're present. They're different from men. When you talk to a man, you think, are you here? <laughs> I, I hate doing men's events. They're just so dull and so boring and I know that nobody's listening. But the incredible thing about women is, is they might be an ocean, but they've got a beach. And on that beach, they're ready to listen. Listen to the lonely, listen to the broken, listen to the famous, listen to the, to the lost, listen to all kinds of people. That's what being a woman is. You need to realise tonight there's something incredibly feminine and incredibly special about you. Somebody actually wrote uh, something at the difference between a man and a woman. And I, I find this incredible. It says, women are compassionate, loving, caring, and they only cry when they're happy. <laughs> Which is really strange. <laughs> women have the ability to keep on smiling even if exhausted. Women will stop at nothing to get what they think is best for their children. Women can turn a simple meal into an occasion and make a man feel like a king. It's not every woman that, is it? <sighs> In my experience. <laughs> women know how to comfort 
a sick friend and will go the extra mile. Women have a will of iron under a soft exterior. Women are easily brought to tears by injustice. Women make the world a much happier place to live. You're allowed to give yourself a clap. Right. <clears throat> Men, what are you laughing at? Men can move heavy things and deal with spiders. That's it. That's it, but the heavier the better. The heavier the better. That's just manhood. Men aren't a mystery. Men aren't a mystery. If they've got a car, they want a bigger car. It may not, you know, if they get a business, they want a bigger business. It's, there's no mystery there, you know. It's only women have the flexibility to be mysterious. It's just men are, everybody knows what men are going to be doing next. But let me, let me say this, and this is what tonight's about, that the, the greatest you is not the natural you. And the natural you is womanhood, it's the feminine. The natural you is your personality. The natural you is your, is your amazing talents. The natural you is, is, is everything that makes you you from when God knit you together in your mother's womb. But that's not the greatest you. And the greatest you is not the new you. If you've been born again by the Spirit of God, the Bible says that you become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old has passed away, the new has come. That you are completely new on the inside. You've been born again by the Spirit of God, not just born naturally, but you've been born supernaturally by the Spirit of God. That's a powerful concept. It's a powerful truth. But the greatest you isn't the natural you and it's not the new you. The greatest you is the next you. It's the you that you're becoming. It's the you that you're morphing into. It's the you that you're transforming yourself into. That's the most powerful you tonight. It's the next you. It's the you that's a, it's the you that's that's a, an alloy between the natural you that's 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 emerging out from under the iceberg, it unites the new you that's growing within you. Every day it's growing. And with the two of them combined together with the power of your choice to move into the future and to become the future you, that's the greatest you that the world will ever see. And that's happening tonight. That we're not here living in the past. We're living in the future. We're becoming the future even right now. It's the next you. And you know, even... The natural you. A lot of us, a lot of you were more you at eight years of age than 38 years of age. And you might think, gosh, yes, there was a storm of 2008 that just ripped me to pieces. That was the cyclone of 2018 that just totally destroyed me. And that was the, the crisis, the flood waters of 2020 that, that totally blew me out of the way. But let me say that you're not actually blown out of the way. You've been buried. And what God wants to do is to unbury you. And it's been happening. He wants to unbury the feminine that's within you. You're like an iceberg. Four-fifths of you is under the surface, but not for long. Because the next you is resurrecting through your choices to become the person that God's called you to be. It's the next you. And it's alloyed with the new you. It's alloyed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And the amazing thing about the Holy Spirit is that God's strength is made perfect in your weakness. Wherever Satan attacked you the most in your teenage years, you'll become the exact opposite of. If you were a city, uh, you'd be Tokyo, you wouldn't be London. If you're a city, you wouldn't be Sydney, uh, you'd be Los Angeles because God builds His greatest cities on the greatest fault lines of weakness within your soul. That's what God builds. If you wanna see where you're gonna become great, have a look at the fault lines, have a look at the, at the breakages in your history. That's where God builds skyscrapers, buildings that scape, scrape the skies of possibility and leave a shadow, cast a shadow over over the culture around about you. It's amazing that people that have marriage ministries often had a terrible marriage. People that do healing ministries are often incredibly sick themselves. Whatever you rise up in will be the exact opposite to what Satan attacked you in in your teenage years. 
The next you is the you that you decide to be. And this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says that as you see Christ, you will be changed from glory to glory, to ever increasing glory. You will not stay the same. You will be transformed, morphed, changed from glory to glory. Everybody thinks that they know you, but they don't actually know you. They know the person you used to be. But the person you're becoming is extraordinary. And for every woman in this room, you're called to become a master of reinvention. You're called to become the Lady Gaga of the Christian world. You're called to, to become, who's the woman was on, that was on the wrecking ball? <laughs> Without the wrecking ball. You're called to become a legend of the Christian world. You, some, some of you have had a hit. You've been, you've been uh, like uh, Natalie Ambruglia, you had one hit. <laughs> you know you're lying naked on the floor. Well, put some clothes on. Just, you're gonna catch a cold doing that. Just get up off the floor. You know, some of you are like the four non-blondes. Like the Baha men, you know, who let the dogs out. I don't know who they let them out, but just stop. Just find the dogs. Just, they're one hit wonders. Chumbawamba, I get knocked down. But I get up again to do nothing. You know, God wants you to be the Barbara Streisland of the Christian faith. You know, God wants you to be the, get ready for it, the Celine Dion. Now we're talking without the Titanic of the Christian faith. God wants you to be a legend. He wants you to become a legend of the Christian faith, not just a one-hit wonder of the Christian faith. Let me say this about the, about the next you, is the next you is the next big thing. If you're wondering what the next big thing is, the next big thing is the next you. And this is what it says in Romans chapter 12, verse number two. It says to, to be transformed, to be changed by renewing of the thinking process so that you can test and approve what God's good, perfect and pleasing will is. So let me paraphrase that. If you wanna test drive God's will, if you wanna test drive the Maserati of God's will, His good, pleasing and His perfect will, if you wanna test drive the Maserati of God's will, then you need to be transformed. And so transformation leads to an opening of God's will that you've never seen before come upon your life. And the best the Bible can describe it is perfect and pleasing and good. There's a perfect and pleasing future that'll open up to every person who goes from glory to glory, who's being transformed by the power of the living God. Stop waiting for the next big thing. God's waiting for the next big thing, which is the next you, for you to be transformed. And when you're transformed, then God opens the future up to everything that God has for you. The problem with God is Satan's really good at condemnation and he's really good at containment and he's, 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 he's really good at, at, at causing you just to be squeezed into the mould of the enemy. And, and what he's got is he's got a Kodak picture of who you used to be. And he's forever waving the Kodak picture of who you used to be. He's always waving at the you that you were yesterday, the you that you were last year, the you that you were two years ago, the you that you were five years ago. And he's waving that Kodak picture over your soul every single day. But it's the past you. The past you doesn't exist anymore because you're actually living in the future you right now. You're becoming the next you. But He has a picture of who you used to be. But let me say this about God, is that God's got a picture of who you're becoming. God's got a Polaroid picture of who you're becoming. And every day when you wake up and every day when you spend time with God, God shakes that Polaroid picture at you to remind you of who you're becoming, not who you were. So when the devil comes with the Kodak picture, 
you know where I'm going with this. You want to grab that Polaroid picture and you want to shake it, shake it, shake it like a Polaroid picture in the face of Satan, in the face of close relatives, in the face of where the condemnation is coming from because there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You're different to how you were half an hour ago because you're being transformed. It's an ongoing process. It's happening in this room right now. You're a brand new creation, but you're emerging. You're evolving. You're being transformed. When I uh, went into the ministry, I got saved uh, ages ago, but then went into the ministry five years later and I, I have a degree in civil engineering at Sydney University. Well, it's, I want to thank the 20 people that helped me get that degree. I hardly did any work at all, right? And, um, and uh, my mum, after I decided to go into the ministry, sent me uh, engineering jobs for six years <laughs> after I went into the ministry. And you know, it's just a mum just wanting, to, wanting me to be known to her. The thing about the next two is that it's a mystery. The thing about the next stew is that it's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going to. And she wanted to fix me in history because better the Dave she knows than the Dave she doesn't know. And there's a lot of uh, parents out in Brisbane tonight that would rather have their kids on cocaine than their kids in church because it's better the kid that we know than the kid that we don't. And some of you can cling on to the past and cling on to where you've come from and cling on to the things of the past because that's what you know. But God's moving you into the unknown. He's moving you into a world that's flowing with milk and honey. It's just you haven't seen it yet. And if you could just let go of the engineering job and allow God to take you into that Polaroid picture, then He's in business. They reckon Michelangelo, when he was... When he was um, Travelling home from work one day, I made that up. There was a block of marble outside Antonio's studio that had a massive crack through it. And he asked Antonio, listen, how much do you want for the block of marble? He said, well, you have it for almost free. And he was happy about that because he was poor, had no money. So he dragged it back to his studio. And then he carved out the greatest statue the world's ever seen, which is the statue of David. And... Uh, and people asked him afterwards, how, how did you do such a work of beauty? He said, when I saw that marble with that fracture through it, he said, I saw an angel caught in that block of marble. And when I took it back to my workshop, I carved away in order to set it free. That's your God tonight. God does not see you as you were. He doesn't just see you as you are. He sees you as you will be. He shakes it, shakes it, shakes it like a Polaroid picture. And He's shaking it tonight. Stop seeing yourself as you were in the last hour, in the last day, in the last year, in the last decade. You are brand new, emerging from glory to glory. The hallmark of Christianity isn't holiness because we get more holy the more we grow. The hallmark of Christianity is change. And you know, you can go up to Mount Gravatt, to Westfield, and you can see someone that was in church three years ago. The difference between them and you is that they've not changed. They're still the same Kodak picture that they were three years ago, but you are totally unrecognisable. Like a caterpillar has been turned into a butterfly. You've emerged out of the ashes. You're like something that's come and risen up out of destruction. You're like something where the Spirit of God's on you, unrecognisable. That's the hallmark of Christianity. And God's changing you, even tonight. He's changing you. You're not how you were. You're how you will be. Grab that Polaroid picture and shake it in your soul. Shake it, shake it, shake it like a Polaroid picture. I, I think you need to realise just four things. Firstly, we need to realise that the, even though you'll try and fit in, you were never really born to fit in. You know, the, the, when Hannah went to Samuel, was brought up in the house of God and she only saw him once a year and, and Samuel, she used to come and, and see him and bring some new clothing to him. And for six months of the year, the clothing was too big. The second six months of the year, the clothing was too small. He was only comfortable for about three weeks of the year. 
But somehow we've got this image that we're meant to fit in. But how can you fit in when you're moving from the past into the future? How can you fit in? You've always been a round peg in a square hole. Uh, Jen and I went to the United Kingdom and I've got to say, we never fit in for a day and because the culture is so different and also because God sent us from the future in order that they might fit into us rather than us fit into them. Too many Christians are trying to find their tribe, they're trying to find their people instead of being the people and being the shape of the future so the present can fit into the shape of the future. The problem with the present is when it does fit into the shape of the future, you've already moved on into a bigger future. When we went to uh, England, uh, we went to the north of England, that's uh, just a depressed culture. And we were like sunshine in the midst of a rainy day. Well, that's why God called us there because we were sunshine in the midst of a rainy day. He didn't call us the Arizona desert. It's already got sunshine. He didn't call us to the Nullarbor. It's, it's already sunny. He didn't call us to Cairns, it has enough sun. He called us to a rainy place because that's where it's needed. And some of you think, well, I really need to fit in here and meet people that are just like me. Hey, stay away from them because you're called in order to compliment the people around about you in order that they might fit in with you and that you might light up their life on a rainy day. If revival ever comes to Brisbane, I'm out of here. I'm not sticking around because I'm a revival maker. Why would there be a need for me? When revival comes, I'm going to go to a place like, like Adelaide, <laughs> a place rarely visited by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to go to Adelaide. I'm going to bring revival to Adelaide. Why? Because I'm a revival maker. And some of you are looking just to replicate and just to fit in and just to be, be somebody that, that you used to be. And yet you're called to be a leader and called to be a breakthrough agent. And you're called to be a square peg in a round hole for the rest of your life until you get to heaven. And then God will celebrate the ministry of you creating bigger holes on the earth today as it begins to fit in with who you want it to become in Jesus' Name. Secondly, the people, that, the people that took you from A to B or the people that you were with from A to B are rarely the people that you're with from B to C. You know, it'd be great to have great friends. There's only a few people that have friends from high school or friends from university or friends from, you know, it just seems to me that the people that, that took you from drowning to surviving are rarely the people that take you from, from surviving to thriving. And you know the, the the you know sometimes you're on a train and the, and 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 you you think that uh, the train next to you is moving and you think gosh how come they're moving and I'm not moving and then you realise that you are moving and let me say this about a lot of friends that you were friends with a year ago you left them a year and a half ago it just took six months before it registered that that you'd be making choices in order to grow and choices in order to change. You, you decided to lay down on the cross of Christ and give your life to Christ. You decided to plant seeds of sacrifice into the soil of barrenness. You decided to, to cling on and surrender all to Jesus Christ. And six months later, it seems like your friends don't invite you anymore to their barbecues and their hangouts and to their parties. Well, that's not because they left you, that's your inferiority complex, is because you left them six months ago when you began to change, when you began to grow, when you began to reinvent, when you went from glory to glory, when the next you started to emerge. And what they were in love with was the former you, the past you. And you can think, and you can think, gosh, everybody's rejecting me. No, it's because you've rejected them because you've chosen the narrow path. You've chosen the narrow way that leads to salvation. You've chosen to become the next you. Everybody's got a, a picture, a Kodak of who you were. You know, sometimes if you were drowning in drug addiction and then you, you pulled out of the lake to the side of the lake by a Christian, they'll always see you as a former addict. It's very hard for them not to do that. And so God's, God's in the business of, of making you go from glory to glory. So He splits you from the person that has the image of who you used to be. And He joins you with somebody who has an image of who you're becoming. It's just that's, that's how it happens. That's why if you've got teenage kids that are, that are growing up a bit, that's why they've got to leave home because you always see them as 12-year-olds. 
And let me say this, you can't not see them as 12-year-olds. It's difficult as a parent not to, not to think there's my young child when they're 32 years of age, right? And so that's why they leave home because they leave home in order that they might reinvent, in order that they might become a master of reinvention, in order that they might go from glory to glory. God gives them the freedom outside of your domain and outside of your dominion. This is the way the earth works. This is the way friendships evolve. And if you're saying goodbye to certain friendships, it just means there's a new group of friends just up the road and maybe here tonight for you to link into. God won't leave you friendless for too long. It's just a moment of cleansing of your soul because sometimes we idolise our friends. Sometimes we over attached to our friends. And so God just puts us on our own just for a little bit of time, but it's not forever. And I'll just say this to everyone in this room right now, it's not forever. If you've had to say goodbye, if you feel like you're not being invited anymore to certain things, it just means that there's a new group that you're about to join. There's a new group of people that are gonna take you from your B to C. They're gonna take you from the plains up to the mountains of potential and possibility. Number three, stop trying to find yourself. You're not gonna like who you find if you're gonna look and try and find yourself. There's a Kardashian in you. No, it's true, there's a Kim Kardashian in every, every woman. It's just, they're, they're in you. Don't, don't try and search out, you'll find the fallen you. You'll find the narcissistic you, you'll find the nasty you, you'll find the naughty you. A lot of people disappear, say, I'm just gonna go off and find myself. Don't, it's, it's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is to define yourself, not to find yourself. You don't want to just be me. You're going to be a mess. You want to redefine who you are. You know, in the beginning of creation, it seems like that's what God spent the first four days doing. He didn't do much creating. He just, the first thing He did is He defined dark from light. Second day, He, he decided to divide sky from sea. These are pretty easy days. <laughs> Third day, just divided land from sea. How to surf. Fourth day, he separated day from night and he created the seasons and he left out Brisbane. And then day six, five, he created sea life. <laughs> and day six, he created land life and created humans. So it seems to me like he spent four days defining, two days demonstrating. It seems to me that he spent four days with the pencil, two days with the power. That's why the next you is the next big thing. Sometimes you're looking for the explosions of the last two days of creation. God's looking to place the pen and the pencil of His power within your hand to get a clean sheet of paper and start to redraw you and start to redefine you and start to bring out who you wanna be, not who others say you are or not who history says you are, but to redraw you. The pen's mightier than the sword. Too many Christians, and I'm into miracles, but they're too much into miracles. The first thing that Jesus did when He, when he met Simon was to redefine him. He got the pencil out, not the power out, or the power of the pencil out. He scrubbed out Simon and He wrote Peter. He scrubbed out Reed and He wrote Rock. It's, it's, it's a delicate change because, because after that, he's still mentioned as Simon. Sometimes Simon Peter, never as Peter Simon. It's weird. You'd think the transformation would be just a linear thing, but it's not a linear thing. It's, it's a bit of a journey. But then in Acts chapter two, it's not Simon who stands up to win 3,000 people to Jesus Christ. It's Peter that rises up to win 3,000 to Jesus Christ. You're becoming Peter right now. You're becoming the person that God's calling you to be. We still need miracles. We still need the power of God. We still need the last two days. But you wanna pick up the pencil of God tonight 
Stop trying to find yourself. Pick up the pencil and redraw you, redefine you. This is who I'm gonna be. My last point is I'm gonna have to look at my notes to find out what it actually is. Well, I just remembered what it was. The old you, it's not you. It's not you anymore. And it's just not you. I remember my wife and I, that we, we, we had a lazy Saturday afternoon and I was just a grumpy guy lying down on the sofa, right? Just awful. And the phone rang. And the moment the phone rang, it was one of the parishioners wanted to talk to the pastor. I've become the man of faith and power for the hour. Just shooting off prayer, shooting off bless you, man. And when I put the phone down, Jen said, you faker. She said, she said you, you just an imposter. She said, she said that, that's, how come you're faking it with your parishioners? But you know, the truth was that the truth was the person on the phone was the real me. The person who was on the couch, irritable and grumpy and a slob. That was the imposter. And when the Bible talks about you, it doesn't talk about you, the sinner. It talks about you, the saint. It never refers to the fallen nature of you as being you. It refers to the new nature of you as being you. I need to say that to you because I'm here to think, well, this is just who I am. No, 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 no. No, that's the fallen you. That's completely under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's completely forgotten about. God's got amnesia. He, he throws your sins as far as the east is from the west and He remembers them absolutely no more. Romans 8 verse 1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I'm big on this. Woken up for the last 24 months, every day Satan's held up the Kodak picture of who I used to be. Well, I just grabbed a hold of the Polaroid picture. I said to Satan, shove this where the sun don't shine. It's a Polaroid picture of who I'm becoming that you have no right to. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm empowered by the Spirit of God. It's the next me and Satan, the next me is the next big thing. So world, watch out. Because this is not just the new Dave. This is the next Dave. This is the Dave that I'm choosing to be. This is the reinvented Dave. This is the Dave with the pencil in the hand, redrawing and redefining who I'm becoming. This is the next big thing. I'm gonna do a super quick altar call. Polaroids up here. You're sitting on a Kodak picture. Some of you need your freedom back. Some of you need your optimism back. Some of you need to shake it, shake it, shake it in front of your accusers and say, this is who I'm becoming. This is who God's called me to be. Some of you need to bring your Kodak and lay it down to the altar and then pick up the Polaroid of God. This is gonna change your life. You've lived under the heaviness of a curse for far too long. You've lived under the words of Simon for far too long when God's already spoken the word Peter over you. Why be the former you when you can be the future you? The future you is the next big thing. But before I do, there's definitely some people here that have never become the new them. That you've known a little bit about God, but you're definitely not born again. When you're born again, the sun rises within you, the God cancels your sins forever. If you were to die tonight, you'd be going straight to heaven because you know that the Spirit of God has cancelled all sin, that you become born again by the Spirit of God. And I'm gonna pray a prayer for people to become born again by the Spirit of God. 
This is also prayer for the people to walk back who have backslidden and you've come along tonight thinking, I'm, this is my last stand, I'm going tonight, but I'm not coming tomorrow night. But you've decided already within your heart that I am all in, that I wanna be the next big thing, that I wanna be the next me, that God's got a vision for my life. And if that's you right now, I'm gonna pray a prayer. Sentence by sentence, I'd love you to pray it with me. Oh, every eye shut right now, all over this place, from the back to the front, from the left to the right. Every woman within this place right now. And if you'd like to, why don't you say this with me? And everybody can say this just to give those who are saying it for the first time more confidence. Dear Lord Jesus, I cannot believe how much you believe in me. You're like Michelangelo to me. You see an angel trapped. But tonight, you've come along to set me free. I thank you for the chisel of the cross to forgive me of my sins and my misgivings. And I thank you for taking me out of my sin and my bondage, and my history. Jesus, be my Lord, be my leader, be everything to me, in Jesus' Name. Keep your eyes closed right now. I'm gonna get you to do one more thing. It's good to do something symbolic right now. And what I'm gonna ask you to do when I count to three, not beforehand, is I'm gonna get you to draw a line in the sand. But because there's no sand here, I'm gonna get you to lift up your right hand and leave it up till all the hands are up. There's people that prayed that prayer for the first time. There's others that, who are backslidden that have prayed that prayer. This is my great return. And it, because it was a prayer of sincerity, not a prayer of huge length. And it wasn't the prayer of the person sitting next to you. It was your own personal prayer. And God respects you. And God respects the words that you just prayed. And God saw the sincerity of it. But we've got no sand to draw a line between history and future, between past and present. We've got no sand, but we have got the opportunity when I count to three with every eye closed, except for a couple of counsellors, to lift up your right hand if you sincerely prayed that prayer. And I'll look around and I'll register it. Let's do it now, every eye closed. On the count of three, I want you to lift up your right hand if you prayed that prayer sincerely from your heart. Three, two, one, lift it up, lift it up, lift it up, lift it up. Higher, 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 higher. On my left hand side, there's one hand, two hand, three hand, four hand. There's five hands in the middle section. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. In the middle section here, 11, 12. At the back, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. On my right hand side, there's 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. Gosh, there's probably about 35 hands that have gone up in this house tonight. That's what the power of God does. It transforms people's lives. And Father God, let the peace of God that passes all understanding, you can put your hands down, be upon the souls of each of these people. Let them know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they've been saved tonight, saved from hell, saved from judgment, freed from condemnation. In Jesus' mighty Name. And everyone said, Come on, let's stand up right now. Let's stand up, let's stand up. We're gonna, as we sing this song, right? As we sing this song, you're gonna have to run down because I'm gonna give you about 15 seconds. That's it, because time's just about up. For those of you who know that you need to rip up that Kodak picture and you need to grab a hold of the Polaroid, this altar call is open in about 10 seconds time. I've got three books available tonight. They're off the stage at the moment, but I've got my book called The Hit Factory and it's catchphrase is the next you is the next big thing. I've got a book that I wrote for men and it's called Man Boobs, A Celebration of the Male of the Species that's available for your husbands and your partners. I've also got Jen's book, which is called She Is, which is a beautiful coffee table book that's available afterwards as well. I'd love you to get a copy of either one, two or all three of those books. Are you ready to run to the altar? We've just got maybe two minutes to do this. I'll give you 15 seconds.